una ponencia bastante interesante que es la impresión, su omnipresencia y la evolución de la misma como interfase nueva. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have so many random bits of technology that I'm a little bit worried are all going to go wrong. Um, and I'll demo those bits at the end. And I hope they're still working by then. Um, yeah, so my name's Kate Stone. And I'm from a small company in Cambridge called Novalia. And what we do is we make printed things, paper, interactive. And um, so I'm going to tell a little bit of my story about, about how I began. Um, and I'll just tell about some, some things from early on in my life, kind of like what inspired me to do what I do. And, um, and then the journey of starting my company and then creating some of the products that we make. Um, so when I was a kid, I was really obsessed with electronics, um, kind of probably a little bit strange. But what I wanted to do was make my bedroom interactive. So I would hide little switches in the walls and little speakers. And I'd run wires under the floor and behind, behind the walls um, so that I could make it so that I could flick buttons and make sounds come and trick my brothers and sisters. Um, I don't know why I did it. I just think because I just liked the idea of of hiding technology and electronics away so no one knew it was there and then it would magically do things. And then I also remember that I, um, I got a kit, the sort of kit you can get from a magazine to make a radio transmitter. And I carved out the back of a book and I hid a transmitter in the back of the book. And then I placed it near my um, father who was sat outside um, and ran back to my radio and tuned in so I could listen to what he was saying. I didn't really want to know what he was saying. I just wanted to I just wanted to do it. It was just something that I wanted to do, kind of hide away these little microphones. But again, looking back, I can see that what I was trying to do was put it in an everyday book. It was, it was, it was just making everyday things have something in them that, that did something different. Um, and then I think as things progressed, I um, managed to basically flunk my high school. Um, didn't do very well at all. So I kind of successfully left without any qualifications. And then um, my parents bought me what turned out to be a one-way ticket to Australia and sent me off to the other side of the world. Um, and I'll just do the next slide. Um, do I do it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I ended, up, um, I ended up on a farm in the middle of Australia. It was really remote. It was 50 kilometers to the nearest town. Um, and it was a 120,000 acre farm, which for me coming from England was pretty big. Um, and the farmer and, and, and his wife and their four-year-old daughter, they kind of took me by the hand and led me on to their farm and sort of taught me the ways of working on a farm. Somehow this is relevant to what I did because it's just kind of part of my journey, right? So everything we all do is all part of our journey. Um, and I had to learn how to cope on this farm. Like I say, it was 120,000 acres. There was 22,000 sheep, and we kind of had to move. My job was to sit on a motorbike and move the sheep around. It's something I'd never done. I'd never even ridden a motorbike before. I lied to get the job. Um, <laughs> and and what, you know, what, what I kind of learned is that at the time, um, I was told and I thought that the sheep were really stupid because they didn't do what, what, what we wanted them to do. And looking back now, I realized that they didn't do what we wanted them to do because they didn't want to be on that farm. They didn't want to be in that 40 degree heat. Um, so we were the ones that were a little bit stupid. But what we had to do was move them around. And so I learned about how we would like build fences and use motorbikes and use horses. And we could move the sheep gradually, all of these sheep, all the way back to the homestead where one by one they'd go through and they'd all they'd all be shorn to make a jumper for someone somewhere else in the world. Um, after a few years, um, I somehow ended up going to university, um, which is kind of, it's almost another story, but, but basically um, I managed, after four years working in Australia, I managed to um, spend my time on the farms and travel and then come back to the UK. And I really, I really learned 
the, I guess the from frustration of not having an education um, because you know I'd be doing my job on farms and factories and then people would come along with a degree who I didn't think were particularly clever and they'd be telling me what to do so I kind of was very passionate about going back to university and I managed to and I managed to work my way up um, from a lot of rejections to to being um, doing a PhD in Cambridge in the UK and my PhD was to move electrons around one by one and what I wanted to do in my project was to move one electron along <laughs> along the wire to the node one electron on and one electron off and I was told by the people that I was working with that that, that wasn't possible to do and what I'd learned on the farm and what I guess I'd felt a lot in my life anyway is that when someone tells me something can't be done it's it's kind of a challenge and to me the there is no such thing as something can't be done. It's just a question of, as to whether the time and resources that you have to expend on doing that are worth the thing that you're going to achieve. So anything can be done if you're naive and have infinite time and money. That's how I look at it anyway. So <laughs> celebrate naivety. Um, so yeah, I managed to move the electrons around and I managed to move one electron on and one electron off. And because of that, I got my PhD. But the way the way, that, the way that it was done, it was about making things really, really small. So the wire that you could see in that was patterned with E-beam to be 40 nanometers wide, so 40 billionths of a meter in width. And the temperature was at um, about minus 270 degrees C. And we moved them around by changing voltages on different areas. So to me, it was exactly the same as working on the farm. You've got the temperature, you've got the size and you change your environment because that's what we did on the farm we it was all about if you change an environment you can make or you can let an object do something if you put your energy into forcing something to happen it, it takes so much energy and it hardly ever happens and that's what I learned doing that you change the environment and what you want to happen happens so after doing my PhD um, I met one of the professors um, who was starting a new company to print um, displays out of plastic transistors. And I really wanted to join a startup company. And so um, I asked him if I, could, if, I could, if I could join. And I interviewed and, um, and I joined that company. And, and I worked there for four years. And the first two years were really, really amazing. Like sort of startup, we can change the world, we can do all these, all these things, we can make these amazing products. Um, and then the second two years, just loads and loads and loads of investment went in. And it just was hell. <laughs> it was really, really hell. I just absolutely hated working there. There was so much money and so much vision in the wrong direction that, that nothing ever really happened. And you know, 12 years later, there's still no product from that company. And they had the largest ever venture capital investment in Europe, which was, um, I forget the number, but it was somewhere between half a billion and a billion dollars in investment. It was just absolutely crazy. And it taught me a lot, really, that if you just have lots of money and lots of resource, it's kind of a burden because to get that money, you have to promise something that at that time, you probably, doesn't, you probably don't know what it is that you're going to achieve, what it is, that, where the real value is, but you kind of get stuck going in a certain direction with that huge amount of investment. But it taught me... A love for printing. So I became really obsessed with, um, as well as my electronics, um, about printing and about how you can use printing to make things. And printing is something that's everywhere. It's in every city. It's used to make things in probably the highest volume that we make anything um, that, we, that, that, that everyone gets their hands on. And it creates products that just a day later are obsolete and you can put down materials. And what I saw when I looked at different printing processes and converting processes, I saw all the processes that were used in a clean room that I'd used to make transistors. It's just that they were being used to make potato chip packets instead. So it's all like a different scale. Um, and so, so I, yeah, I'd left where I was and I started out in my garage on my own and um, with this vision that I wanted to print transistors, but I really didn't know why. Um, but also what I wanted to do was put conductive inks down onto paper and onto plastic using a regular printing press and, and make that paper interactive. And when I told people what I wanted to do, the printing companies, they told me it couldn't be done. So again, I saw it as a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, so 
this is kind of a scary moment. I basically got a lot of credit cards, a lot of loans, and I was probably a little bit naughty about when I did and didn't pay my tax. Um, and I managed to get enough money to buy this big printing machine, which is um, about five meters long. It runs at, say, 100 meters or more a minute. And I didn't have a clue how to use it. Kind of just like that motorbike that I really didn't have a clue how to ride, which I fell off every single day. Um, and I just made a massive mess. I got myself and the floor and everywhere totally covered in ink. But I kind of figured out how to use it just enough to do something to show someone what I'd done. And when I showed the printing companies what I'd done, they were, why didn't you come to us in the first place? This is easy, which is kind of what generally happens once you show those people who say you can't do things that you've done it. They go, oh, yeah, but you've done it that way. I didn't know you were thinking of it that way. Um, yeah, so. So um, I think where well, I am. So um, I had this printing press, and I was putting down conductive inks, and I was combining that with, with um, I mean, I was starting out printing transistors, but I realized that was too much research for the future. So I started using regular silicon chips stuck onto the paper that I printed. And I kind of made bits of paper with these square lines on, and when you touched it, a light would come on. And it's kind of pretty useless really and then I had a summer student working with me who was um, an, an art student um, and into graphic design and and someone had asked me to create a box that had something on it with my technology so I made a box that when you opened it the light came on and the student looked at it and she said that's totally useless why would anyone want that <laughs> but as an engineer I thought it was really good so she made this cat and the cat's eyes had LEDs in them and the cat is a circuit. And when you open the box, the cat's eyes light up. And I looked at it and said, that's totally useless. Why would anyone want a box with cat's eyes that light up? But everyone I showed really, really loved it. And it inspired me a lot. And it just changed my thinking so much from where I was as a scientist and an engineer to really appreciating like art and design and seeing that the art, the design, the science and technology just all have to be one thing and, and you can't separate them. So in this circuit, the tracks run off to the bottom where there's a switch and a battery. But if you take away the cat, there's no longer a circuit. Um, and if you take away the circuit, there's no longer a cat. So we kind of end up with this thing that's, it's all those things combined and, and you can't even separate them. So the first person that I hired was a graphic designer um, and I just asked her to design a greetings card and be really heavy on the line art. Um, and then what I'd do is go in on Photoshop and I'd make um, little cuts in Photoshop to let the circuit kind of find its way through. So the art has to come first, kind of like the environment. And then the circuit and the technology has to find a way to match with, within, within that environment. Um, and also we'd managed to... Um, well, I'll tell another story. One of my colleagues was putting down some LEDs onto some um, paper with some tracks on, and it had a battery on it. And um, it was really difficult to do, and she was getting a bit fed up. And she put one down, and she kind of went, she just kind of like blew on the paper, like, oh. And then the lights came on, and we looked at it, and it's like, wow, we've invented a breath sensor. That's amazing. So that's why we decided to make this greetings card, because we were so clever that we'd invented this breath sensor. Um, Let's see. So, oh, it's supposed to be a video. So, what happens is, where you touch the card is naturally is the switches. So, you just touch the ink, and then you blow on it, and it blows the candles out. And then, um, I'm not sure if the audio is plugged in, but it makes um, it plays a tune once you know, once, once that's happened. But we try to like create quite a natural process. So where you pick it, you don't have to know where to touch. Just where you hold it is the button. The ink is the button. And then you blow on it because that's what happens when lights come on. And when you blow on it, only, only half the candles go out because that's what happens in real life. So you have to blow on it again. So what we were doing is trying to create a dialogue between a person and a piece of paper without any instructions and just in a really natural way, without any technology being visible, just just a beautiful object, paper object, that does something. But the thing about print is, print is all about communication. 
but that communication is only from the print to you, and then it ends. So it kind of inspired us with this idea that you have a piece of paper that you look at, it makes you touch it. When you touch it, it does something else, you do something else, and communication is supposed to be two-way. So you end up with this kind of two-way dialogue between you and a natural object. So I sold the printing press and started working with the printing companies. Um, so we'd design our plates and we'd make conductive inks out of silver um, and carbon and we'd run them through the press. And then I'd have to measure them and see whether they work or not. So in some ways, what, what I've done and, and what, what my team have done with me, we've not really created anything, any individual thing that's new. We've kind of just like brought different things together. I mean, conductive inks have been around for a long while, and greetings cards, and printing processes, and the electronics that we use, we actually use in the 6502 chip. So we're using basically the chip that was, in, that was in the Apple II, but it's really low cost. And we're just sticking that onto a bit of paper, and we're connecting it all up. So to me, it's all about gathering the jigsaw pieces, bringing them together, and then just making something come alive, I guess. Um, yeah. So I have um, a few slides of some of the things that we've made as well. So um, as well as electronics um, and print, I'm a little bit obsessed with cake. So I really love cake. So this poster is all about cake. Um, you touch the poster, and it has a speaker behind it that makes this poster start to, to talk to you. Um, and it asks you these four questions about cake. Um, do you like chocolate, fruity, or one of the classics? Um, you touch it, so you just touch the answer, and then it asks you the next question about texture, about priority, and about occasion. And then in the end, um, you touch the finish button. And this poster doesn't tell you what your cake is, which is kind of like what you'd expect. What the poster does is it uploads a photograph, a description, and why it chose that cake for you to our Facebook page. So we kind of have a lot of pictures of cake on our Facebook page, which is a little bit of a problem. I think we got banned from Twitter for a little while because it was going to Twitter too. So what we're trying to do is like take a regular poster, which is kind of like the user interface that we have around as most of the time is print, but take some of what you have on the internet and stick that into a poster but not make it obvious that there's any technology there. We kind of just want it, it to be seamless. So how can you make a poster become a portal to the internet? And then you have to think like, how do you design for that? How do you write the software? How do, we, you know, how do people know where to touch? But it's really incredible how people actually do know where to touch without, um, without us even, even telling them. Um, so something else that we've, um, we're working on with a pharmaceutical packaging company um, is a carton that can remind you when to take your medication. So um, I always forget these things. I get a little bit confused. So on this carton, it has some silver tracks that run along where the, where the, the tablets go. And when you take a tablet, the carton knows that you've taken the tablet. And then there's some LEDs on it. And then the LEDs start to light up when it gets closer to the next time to take the medication. But if you're like me, I take a tablet and then instantly think, did I take a tablet? <laughs> I'm not sure. So there's a button on there that I call the Am I There Yet button. Um, and you press it and it just basically tells you, don't worry, you've just taken it. There's another four hours. So it's kind of as much as anything about re reassuring people about how to use their medication and about reminding people. Um, but really, it's actually about monitoring people because the biggest cost, one of the biggest costs um, in pharmaceuticals is compliance. So when people take their medication, it's different to when they tell, they tell their doctor they take their medication. And so the prescriptions get changed and all of that. So there's kind of like a big interest in the doctors knowing what was taken and when, and knowing if there's a difference between the two. So again, we're like, we're trying to like, help people, but then also trying to do what we need to have done as well. So yeah, sometimes I have a saying, which actually sounds a bit sinister, but it's not meant to be, is that I don't make people do what I want, I let them, which I think comes back to moving lots of sheep around or lots of electrons around. Um, 
Something else that we've created is a large poster. It's about this size. And it's a poster um, about a kid called Tyler. And it's about teaching children um, about choice and about consequence. So you touch this poster at the top, and it starts to talk to you and tell you about Tyler's day and him rowing with his dad and messing about with his music. And he's never gone anywhere in life. And he's always hanging about with the kids on the corner. And then he runs out of the house angry. And then it says he has to choose. Does he go with the kids on the corner? Or does he go off to town on his own? And basically, you touch the poster, and you choose. And you have these different life outcomes. So there's six different life outcomes through, through choosing these things on the poster. And nearly everyone who, um, who plays it always goes for the worst outcomes first. Everyone, I think, seems to explore the dark side <laughs> before they, they go off to the good side. So the worst outcome is that he ends up let many years later going to jail. And then the good outcome is that he becomes a pop star. And then other things are he has a good day or doesn't have a good day. Pretty boring things, really. Um, yeah. Um, so something else that we've, I keep saying that same thing. Um, <laughs> we've created a book. Um, and I was actually asked by a company who, um, who, who manufacture books for other people to use with their graphics in. And, and they told me that to show this off at the trade fair, they always showed off blank white books. And I wanted to show off all my ideas as to what I could do in this book. And I didn't think showing anyone a blank white book that when you touched buttons you couldn't see, that played sounds you couldn't hear, was really going to be very convincing. Um, especially as I try to hide all the technology away so you can't see it. So I insisted on putting some things in there. So um, I put in a few stories. I went on Wikipedia to get some, some knowledge um, and on YouTube for some sounds. Um, and so, so, for example, on the back page, there's a capacitive touch pad that we've printed. And you plug your headphones into this book. So if you type in the right one, and it's quite appropriate after yesterday, um, instead of just reading about the lunar landing, you can actually hear the words, I mean, if anyone you know, was watching yesterday and heard when those words were said as they stepped out, it definitely gives you goosebumps. It's really, really emotional. And hearing it is no nothing like reading it. And you have sound combined with a picture in a beautiful book. I think that's every bit as good as watching something on a screen, especially as it's in a really nice book that you can have on a shelf or have on a coffee table. And so again, it just started to reinforce more and more the direction that I was going, which is regular objects, the sort of things that we think are going to be wiped out by computers. You know, People are saying it's the death of printing and the death of books. And I don't believe that at all. The more I've explored it, and the more I see all of these things that give us amazing user experiences online and on a computer, we can start to put them in things around us and make those things become amazing. And then it starts to make me think, is it the book that will disappear or is it the computer that will disappear? And I'm like, actually not really sure in terms of people and in their homes. So this is a postcard. And when you touch the things on the postcard, it makes the words appear on the app on the cell phone. And that postcard's two millimeters thick. And to put that in that postcard would cost less than a dollar. So we can take something like that, connect it to a cell phone. But if it's connected to a cell phone, it's connected to the internet. So you can have a postcard that you could touch or give to someone, and they touch it, and it will play video on their phone if they have the app. That's all they need to do is have the app. It's just a postcard. And it's really simple to do. All that happens is when you touch that postcard, it makes different sounds. The app has the microphone open. Here's the different sounds, knows what's to do. So we're creating codes within sounds. So it's a really low cost and easy way to connect from a piece of paper to a cell phone and onto the internet. That one's quite fun. Um, we've kind of develop that a little bit, but not quite as far as we'd want to. Um, so something else we've been, again, <laughs> something else we've been working on um, is a newspaper project with some universities in the UK. And they were really keen to explore what would happen if we put our technology into a regular newspaper and gave it to a group of people, say about 20 people, and see what they thought of it and how they experienced it. So 
we took this newspaper and we put a special page in behind the front page to add in um, the capacitive touch. Um, and so in the top right, you can touch it and you can hear through your, because it connects to your cell phone, so you can hear through your headphones, you can hear a track playing from the artist that's at the top. So normally it'd be advertising and telling you where to download the music. On this, you just touch the page and you hear the music. Um, there's a, an editorial that's been written about a press conference that the Prime Minister had. And instead of hearing what the editors made of that story, you can touch the button and hear the actual press conference. So you can know what was really said and know, you know what was true, what wasn't true. We've also put a Facebook like button on the newspaper so you can Facebook like something or Facebook like some product. And also you can vote. So we put some voting buttons on so you can say whether an article's good or not or a product is good or not. So um, it's always difficult to remember what I have to say on the blank slides. <laughs> the ones with the pictures are very, very easy. Um, I think what I wanted to talk about just a little bit was about my perspective on the future of a few things. So thinking about newspapers, I guess inspired by that, and that you know, we think that newspapers are going to die out, we think that books are going to die out. And as I was saying before, a lot of things are in decline, like including the high street, because of what happens online, because of what we can do with technology. But I really do believe that as we start to bring that more and more into everyday things, that we can sort of breathe some life into those products. And a lot of those, they're products that people really love. People love music in some ways in a physical form. People love books to have on a bookshelf and have on a table. Um, you know, and people like going in into a store and actually seeing a product. But you also like to know the person who bought this also bought this. You also like to hear a review. You also like to see that people are liking things. You also want to tell people that you're looking at something. All of that sort of social media stuff is kind of what's causing a lot of the decline. But if we can start to bring that into everyday things, then I think, I think it, can, it can breathe a lot of life back into those things. And I, I, I really believe it will change things a lot. Because once I get it in my mind that that can happen, I, I can't see how how it cannot happen, how you can't walk into a store, touch a poster, say you walk into a fast food store, touch a poster with the graphic of the thing you want, connects to your phone in your pocket, through your purse, they know your name, and then they just shout out your name when you've ordered your product. I, that sort of thing is totally possible now. We just have to get people to adopt it. Also, I think, I guess actually I've not explained exactly how I do what I do. Um, let's see if I have grab something. So my presentations are always very unstructured. I never know what I'm going to say next. So, um, so we print conductive inks on the back. So there's silver and carbon ink printed on the back of this. And we can print that with any regular print process. So screen, offset lithography, um, or flexography. So any of the sort of like main mass manufacturing print processes, we can put that material down. And then on the other side, we print our graphics. And then we've created a small electronics module that has a couple of chips on. One of the chips is a cap touch chip. Um, and one of the, the chips um, on a lot of the things is a Bluetooth chip. And that just sticks on there, connects to that. And then this whole thing then is now interactive. As soon as we stick that on, um, this is now on the internet through my phone. Um, and actually the hardest bit of all to do was to figure out how to stick those two things together. It's taken me years how to figure out a simple way to do that, which now I realize it was so dumb how I do it. But, <laughs> but, but it's become very, very enabling. And that's something that I did um, only sort of at the end of last year. Um, so I guess the thing is with that is there's very, very little hand assembly. This doesn't have to have lots of people putting things together by hands. Lots of wires, lots of connecting things, attaching little pieces, assembling little buttons. And that, like I said before, I think, the printing press, printing presses are in every city, in every country in the world. And we can create these little electronic modules that can be made wherever and can be programmed locally. The print can be done locally. But most importantly, the design can be done locally. So we don't all have to have 
the same product that's designed in California, made in China, and it's available in black or white. Because it's like, there's a lot more in the world than black or white, unless that's what I think. So I love the idea that, you know, the, the platform that I create, people here could design amazing products based around that and have it made locally. And I don't need to have anything to do with it at all. And they can be made anywhere. So we can start to see beautiful design that's relevant locally and manufactured locally that kind of like makes a lot more sense. And I think there's other people thinking along the same lines too, you know, about local manufacture. And this really enables that a lot because electronics is one of those things that's just generally mainly made in Asia. And that's why we have to have so many products the same. So, I've absolutely no idea of time. Do you know how long I've been speaking for? No. <laughs> I have no idea at all. Um, so something else, again, we have created is we've worked with some inks that change color. Um, so these inks, when you put a voltage across them, they can change from dark to light. It's kind of a little bit like the ink material, but it's, it's called electrochromic inks. And we made, we made a poster. Um, so when we made a poster that is like of a tree, and we've also got another one. I don't think I've got a graphic of it. There's like of a scene, and there's a telephone box, and um, and there's also like rabbits and flowers and other sorts of things in this scene. Anyway, it does have a purpose. The the poster is connected to the energy monitoring, um, an energy monitoring system, in someone's home or an office or a school, and if their energy usage over a few days starts to become worse, then the tree gets it, <laughs> really. The leaves start to fall off the tree. And then the other one, um, like there's a graffiti on the park bench and the windows get broken. But if the energy usage of someone starts to um, get better, then the leaves reappear, the fruit comes back, and the bunny rabbits appear, and everything looks good. So what we're trying to do is, is create something that people would want to look after. Like, you kind of like have a pot, you know, if you have a plant in your home, you water it because you don't want it to look awful. But because we were involved in this in a project sponsored by the government to look at how we could use design to help people be more energy efficient. And I think if you tell people, be more energy efficient because otherwise some village on the other side of the world gets flooded or some trees disappear somewhere else, you kind of care. But sometimes in the moment you kind of it's not your highest priority. So we wanted to create something that was like more in your face. Something that if you look after to make your home nice, then um, it will have a benefit for the world. And it, again, to me, everything's similar to the sheep. So it's more like letting people do what you want them to do rather than trying to make them do what you want them to do. Um, I think, uh, yeah, and also um, it connects online. So you can see online, um, you know, how it's trending and you could like compare it to other people and all that sort of thing. So, okay, so, um, so I think I mentioned about design before and I'm really, really interested in, in working with anyone that's creative um, in any form, like whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's design. And I always try to combine that with my work as much as possible. So. Um, this, this is a young singer-songwriter that I'm working with. Um, she's actually my niece, but she's really, really good. <laughs> um, and I love working with her. So, um, and I've just got a few photos of some of the stuff we've been doing together, which actually we did just this weekend. Um, and so this was um, Saturday in Cambridge. Um, but the two posters that she has, that she's put either side of her with her name on, um, are actually the sound system. So we've taken a really nice graphic that one of my colleagues designed for her. Um, and we use an actuator, which is a device that sticks on the back of the print and makes the whole print vibrate. So the whole poster for us is a speaker. So we don't have like little speakers. The whole poster, the whole thing you look at is where the sound comes from. So as she's singing and playing on her guitar, the music's coming out of the artwork, which is kind of like, in my world, that's what happens. <laughs> um, and actually, this is just, um, this was the following day. The BBC got really interested in the UK. So we went to play in a park in London um, to pretend that we were busking. And they wanted to film us 
doing it the old way, and then how, and then describing for their technology show um, how this, you know, how we would work together, and how how her music and our technology goes together to do things in a very, very different way. Um, have another poster. Oops. I don't. Um, Okay, so I don't know whether you're able to hear this at all, but this poster, when you touch it, it plays different samples of her music. So, can I hear anything? No. <laughs> can you hear anything? No. <laughs> yeah. So again, it's the same thing. I mean, it's a, it's a graphic. Oh yeah, good idea. I'll help you. Oh, it's Sunshine morning. Shake, shake, shake it. Sunshine. Get the idea. <laughs> so, the thing is, musicians. Um, can I can I be heard? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So. Most bands have posters, right? And those posters are to let you know about them and their music, and they put them up, and they do nice funky graphics and stuff. But um, bands are about music, and the posters don't have any music in. So again, in my world, like a poster that's up somewhere for a band um, should have samples in their music, should have samples of their music in it. And I, if it can be done, like why won't that happen in the future? Why won't we have posters in the street? in a store or you know in a bar you want to hear a little bit of the person's music you just touch it and you hear some of their music and then also we have another version where you touch it and it can download samples to your phone and if you have our app on the phone you don't even need to get your phone out because the communication for this is done with low power bluetooth so so long as you have the app running in the background as soon as you touch it the music would be well it would the poster tells the phone to download the music from the internet, of course. It's not going to send it over, the, over that link. Um, but it can, also, it can also download vouchers or tickets or whatever. So, or again, you can have the Facebook like or send a tweet. You can send the tweet from that poster to say, hey, I've seen this great band. And just all you've got to do is touch a poster. <laughs> um, and this is something really, really new that we're working on. That um, you can see from the graphics. I mean, I only received these graphics as I landed. I think as I, I think I got these graphics yesterday of some things. So it says doodly bits around here, um, and um, we're working with a company called Chapter Press um, to make this book. And I've seen some of the books they make. They're really, really beautiful books. As soon as I saw their books, I just like fell in love. The the books have just just the most amazing textured paper or card. The pages are really thick. It's a really nice hardback book. And they've made this book so you can have CDs that are actually within the pages, really discreetly, that you can pull out. So we're making a book about Charlotte. And then there's going to be a page in the book. Um, and this is just, we're just working on this at the moment. But you'd have your cell phone next to the, next to the book, uh, or in your pocket. And you can touch things in the book. So. You can go to her website, you can listen to the latest music video, um, when is the next gig, look at stuff on Twitter. Um, but I quite like the idea that you can have a book, that maybe you might buy at a concert, that the content for that book hasn't actually happened yet. Maybe there's interviews with the artist, maybe there's live recordings that actually happen after you've bought the book. But you've got this really, really nice souvenir book. I mean, we kind of all buy things when we go to concerts. So why not have that connect, have those things connect to the internet and have all of the things that you might get from someone's website? Ah. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's just going to be this sort of coffee table book there's something you'd buy from an event um, and then has all of what you might get on a web page or what you might get on YouTube and then you don't have to know where to go you don't have to look things up maybe like when you were a kid oh dear sorry help um, 
You know when you're a kid and, and you want something, you just kind of point at it or touch it? That's what I want the world to be like. I don't want to have to do anything else apart from go, I want that one, and then it just happens magically. Um, actually, I, this morning I threw some more slides in. Um, I really love, <laughs> this might seem a bit weird, but I really, really love going walking. It's an obsession that I got about 10 months ago. Um, so I thought I'd put some holiday pictures in just to show you some of the places that I go. But to me, it has a lot of meaning. And um, I just wanted just maybe just to share a few of the things like that I've kind of like had in my journey on starting a company and how incredibly difficult it is, or at least I'm finding it is, and I think most people do, to go from like I've got an idea of something that I think I can do that's different, that's of value, from that to an actual product where you make some money. And you, we just see so much like instant success around us of Maybe, I don't know if you have like a TV show like Dragon's Den or Shark Tank or anything where people go on, pitch an idea and suddenly it happens or Pop Idol or X Factor. And I think what I've learned is, and from talking to other people, is that overnight success takes about 10 years. And I've been going for eight. So if I have a success anytime soon, then I'm ahead of schedule. And that, <laughs> but that's something that I've kind of had to learn. Um, when, I, when I go on my walks, um, I take everything I need in my backpack and I go for two or three days and usually I do have friends but <laughs> my friends aren't very brave. <laughs> I do actually have, I have two friends <laughs> um, but <laughs> I, go, I go on these, I go on my own for like two or three days with all my stuff and um, right in the very, very distance is the mountain that I'm going to go over and it's covered in snow. And when I get out of the car and start off and I see the mountain in the far, far, far distance, I usually want to get back in the car because I just think, oh my God, it's going to take me an actual day to get to the beginning of my journey. And I think for me and what I've done, starting out in my garage, printing my transistors, which were good but useless, um, to get to where I am now of knowing my vision and what it is I want to do, that's like been like six years or so of just journey, just, just to get to the big, very, very beginning. And then you kind of get to the mountain and then you kind of think you've made it, but it's like, holy shit, now I've actually got to climb the mountain. <laughs> and it's really steep. Um, and this was one I went along a few months ago and it's a really exciting walk. Um, remember I have a big backpack on because I'm carrying everything that I need for a few days. And this particular walk, it's a really narrow ridge that goes along for a long way up the mountain and there's a thousand feet drop other side so you're kind of like walking along this thing and you're thinking you're going to fall off, fall off the edge. But I do it I think because that's how it feels like every day what, what I'm doing you know on my journey. This is just all these massive challenges but I have to 100% believe that I will make it and I think the biggest, the biggest um, risk when I'm walking and when I'm in my business is panic. If I panic that things won't happen, that I won't make any money, then that's, you know, that's when you kind of hit failure. Um, actually walking along the ridge, as scary as it is, is kind of easier than bits like this. Because in bits like this, this was the next day. Um, I was going up and up and the clouds came down and the rain and sleep was horizontal and hitting me in my face that I couldn't even look at. And I had no idea where the path was. And you can see where it's all hitting the stones there. And I really, really felt that I needed to turn back. And I had absolutely no idea where I was going. But I just still had to keep my vision and just realize that sometimes the path isn't clear. You really have no idea at all. You have to just kind of keep on going. These are all of my little stories that I get in my head as I'm walking along. Um, and that's kind of the place that I sleep on my own and that's kind of how it is in my job as well on my own I mean I have a team of people but like all the responsibility is mine and if anything goes wrong it's my fault then you know we all fail but I'm kind of happy in my little tent on the edge of a cliff <laughs> a thousand feet up um, and then 
you kind of get to the top of the mountain. And, and now I don't even bother knowing what the mountains are called because what I've learned is that like getting to the top, the point where you kind of think you've made it, that last little step is nothing. It's, it's the easiest step. The first step when you get out and you look at what's in front of you, or when you get to the bottom of the mountain and you look at what you've got to do, or where you're kind of like walking along this ridge and you're scared of where you're going to put your feet, and when you, then you're on the path or you can't see the path and you don't know where to go. Those are the really, really difficult steps. And so I kind of believe that the moment of success is the darkest hour, is your most difficult time. It's the moment when everyone else would have given up but you. And it's just about that. It's just about going forward. So, so that's my little motivational speech. Am I, how am I for time? Am I? So, right, right, right. Actually, I've not got too much left. It's fine. Um, I'll show you some posters that make some noise, hopefully. Um, I have to put a battery in something for this, so bear with me. <laughs> Actually, this one will be okay. Are you um, sure? There's four posters, and one of them is the one I want, and they all look the same. <laughs> oh, yeah, got the right one. Sorry, I need to just get an app. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try and do some live demos, which can go horribly wrong. So we'll just have to see. So this is the Bluetooth poster that we have. So it just has this board sticks on the back, and then we have the graphics. Bear with me. <laughs> Is there any sound on this? Uh, can't hear it. I can't get it to work. Should I definitely? I uh, can't hear it coming out of here anyway. Okay. If I've got time, bear with me. Hopefully it's worth it. I'm used to this, so I don't really care. I don't care. Hopefully it'll be all right. Okay. That is not happy. Never mind. <laughs> Do you have the microphone? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, the actual microphone. I'll show you these ones instead. <laughs> so you can, <laughs> you can play with them. These have some, a few wires on the back, but you can have a play if you want. Make some noise. <laughs> Yeah, so they, this is the poster that you can... Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to try one out? If anyone wants to play, actually try and play drums... <laughs> Maybe the microphone again. Actually, you hold it and I'll try and play it. <laughs> That's the best I can do at playing drums. Um, <laughs> thanks. I wish the other one worked, but because... I wanted to show you this one because I actually have another app that I run. So this normally runs a drum app. So when you play drums, the drums comes out of the poster. 
but I've not done it on the stage before. I was trying to run a different app that we've got where I can show you that I could send some tweets from the drums or I can use this as an iTunes controller so I can change the volume, I can skip the tracks and play different songs. So it's like we've done a drum poster because it's kind of fun and then a lot of people really love it and then other people are like it's a poster that plays drums, you know, why is that important? But it's kind of important because by just changing the app and changing the graphics, this poster can do anything. It can do, it's just an interface to an iPad or an iPhone or any smart device, it can go on any wall. You, know, you can do gestures on it, you could, when, we, when we put multi-touch stuff in there, we can make this poster do anything. But we kind of started out with this. And I was kind of saying about the struggle of the startup and everything, you know, and it's a real struggle that we have. The biggest question we get from people at the moment is, what do you have in production at the moment? And kind of don't really have anything in production. And everyone loves our staff and gets excited about it being next year's big thing. But they want to kind of see something now. So we put this on Kickstarter, um, hoping that we can get some support to put this into a factory, get lots of them made, and then give everyone a poster and like, have everyone playing with them, and then have lots of people come up with lots of different ideas that can be done with this poster. Because I can come up with a few ideas, but it's going to be people like you that are going to come up with things I couldn't even dream of that we can do when we can make our bedrooms or our workspaces connect to our computers. And I want to get that in people's hands. And that's kind of the help that I need. Because then, once this is in a factory and I've made 10,000 or more of them, I know I can really easily make it to make anything. Um, right. One more demo and then I think I'm done. Um, just hope this one works. This one is totally different, so I'll persevere with this one a little bit more, even if it doesn't work. What makes it so difficult here is there's so much Wi-Fi and so, so much Bluetooth, it's really not, it's not natural. <laughs> more difficult under pressure. It's really more difficult under pressure. Okay. Can I have it a bit louder? This is my favorite bit ever. <laughs> These are my DJ decks, and they're a piece of card. And I'm a, like, well, I kind of say like I'm a little a secret DJ. I mean, but I think everyone is, really. It's a secret little bit of a DJ in everyone. And the only bit I want to do is kind of, it's just that. <laughs> it's just scratching the decks. <laughs> I just, oh. So I have the two deck. It's my knee singing again, um, and I have my cross fader. Um, I can spin the track. Um, yeah, I love it. It's my favourite thing. I wish we could put that on Kickstarter. It's just we chose the drums first, so it's probably a bit of a mistake. But yeah. Okay. Can turn the sound off. <laughs> so. That's basically just kind of, that's my journey and my story really. Just um, when I started out, not having a clue what I was doing, I knew just that I wanted to do something different. I knew I wanted to explore different ways that things can be made and different ways that we can bring different people together. I love working with creative people, artists, designers, musicians, and I want my work to just be 
just below, beneath what they do, because that's how things should be. Like everything we see in, in nature has amazing science behind it, but what we see is like a beautiful flower or a beautiful landscape or universe. So it's kind of like things need to look good and feel good first and foremost. So I think everything that I create is all about, I want to make amazing user experiences um, and not really show off technology. So that's my story. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate. Muchas gracias por tu participación. Estoy seguro que tendrán muchas.